Hi everyone, this is our channel Around My Story. Please like, share and subscribe. My name is Ricardo. Though I am a 21 year old, my body is the size of a 10 year old boy because I was born with a disease called Prader-Willi Syndrome, PWS, which stunted my body growth while allowing my mind to continue developing. Most people would consider PWS to be a curse, but it was a gift for dad and me because we took advantage of this situation. My story starts when dad's company accused him of embezzlement and fired him. The scandal and shame of this incident kept him from getting any other type of work, so we left our country to start a new life elsewhere. Dad was still unable to get a job because his old company always gave him bad references when called by prospective new employers. Dad was worried about our future, so he improvised and came up with a scheme to turn me into the goose that laid the golden egg. You see, children always bullied me due to my small body size. Luckily, my mature mind helped me avoid fights most of the time. One day, Dad asked me if I wanted to become famous, and I said, sure. He told me that we needed a way to gain people's sympathy, and he explained his plan. We went to the garage and found some old torn clothes that he asked me to wear. Then he poured dirty water on me. Then he made a recording of me crying and explaining that I had been beaten by some bullies in our neighborhood. After we finished making our sympathy garnering video, he applauded my performance and posted it to the internet to see what reaction we would get. The next day, our video went viral and I became an instant celebrity. All the news agencies gave the video broad coverage and I began receiving sympathetic phone calls and donations from around the world. Several international schools offered me free scholarships at their schools, and I managed to amass a good size of money from all the donations, and for a moment, I thought our days of poverty were finally over. Unfortunately, the authorities investigated my background and found that I was 21 years old and not really a kid at all. Then, all my fortunes reversed themselves, and the police came after me for fraud. I am speaking to you now from a hotel room as I hide from the police. I have enough money to head to another country, preferably one that has no extradition treaty with my country. I have enough money to live comfortably without needing to work for the rest of my life. So on balance, I don't have any regrets about what I've done. I am addicted to food. I suffer a lot. I need help. I've tried to give up, but I fail every time. Hamburgers. Who can give up eating hamburgers, especially with barbecue sauce? I didn't mind this kind of addiction, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me begin by introducing myself. I am Patricia, 15 years old, living with my parents and my brother. I lead a quiet life. No interests, no hobbies, except for eating, that is. Food is my faithful friend. It never leaves me. It is my partner, my soulmate. But having food as your soulmate has insidious side effects. A dark side, if you will. It denies me a healthy life, robs me of the energy to play, and causes me to sleep excessively. I would much rather stay at home with a bag of potato chips than go out and exercise. My soulmate ultimately betrayed me, though, last Thanksgiving at my granny's home. She lives in a state nearby. Granny was a clever doctor and an excellent cook at that. She could conjure up something really delicious. On that day, she had prepared barbecue turkey with nuts and other secret recipe ingredients. The taste was so great, as if it had descended from heaven itself. I felt like I was fighting a food war, and I had to win at all costs. I ate and ate and ate. I don't know why, but I just couldn't control myself. I attacked that turkey like it was the last on the planet. But every culinary war with a worthy adversary, such as the barbecued turkey, has its own unique type of casualties. Suddenly, I found myself unable to breathe. I fell to my knees and passed out. The turkey had won. I woke up later in the hospital, though, still clinging to an unfinished turkey leg. The doctor told me that I was gaining way too much weight. He said that I should be put on a diet. Diet? Man, how I hated that word. It hung over my head like the sword of Democles. It meant depriving me of my passion, my reason for living. 
I considered eating vegetables in small amounts to be the worst form of cruel and unusual punishment. The worst form of torture imaginable. Imagine thinking of a wonderful, greasy, cheese-laden pizza with all the toppings and then suddenly opening your eyes to find a healthy green salad bowl. But I had reached a turning point in life. One day, my brother was playing on the street while I was sitting at home gazing longingly at a tempting piece of cheesecake, just sitting there, taunting, daring me to eat it. I struggled mightily to resist the urge, but in the end I succumbed and wolfed it down like a starving animal. Shortly afterwards, I began feeling dizzy, but I was unable to call for help this time, and then I passed out again. I was taken to the hospital, while lying in the hospital bed, half-conscious, I overheard the doctor say to someone, she needs to stop eating or it will be the death of her. I thought to myself, whoa, death? So I made up my mind right then, right there. I resolved to fight a new war, a war against my appetite. On our way back home, I told my father that I wanted to see a nutritionist. He was delighted to hear that. Later, at the clinic, the doctor welcomed us in. She told me how to overcome my eating fetish. She gave me a strict diet regimen, with a schedule full of healthy meals. I kept telling myself that winning this war was possible. I simply had to be patient and persevere. I stuck to the strict diet and did some physical workouts. My parents supported me wholeheartedly. I was enthusiastic. I can totally do this. A week passed quickly, and I eagerly visited the doctor to receive some good news. When the doctor weighed me and told me that my weight hadn't changed at all, I was crestfallen. She looked at me and asked me, how was this possible? I told her I didn't know, because I was following her diet thoroughly, though it did require a tremendous effort on my part. Another week passed, and again I went to the doctor. The results were the same. She said to me, Patricia, are you sure you're following the diet I prescribed for you? I said yes. She sat there wondering. Then she told me with a puzzled look on her face, It's odd, but your weight is increasing, not decreasing. This unexpected piece of news mystified me. Another week passed. No change. The doctor was nonplussed. I returned home with a dejected look on my face. My father asked me what was wrong. And when I told him, he laughed. Do you believe that? My father actually laughed at my predicament. I was furious. He gestured an apology with his hand and then told me that it was my own fault. I was puzzled. What are you talking about? He told me that I had been sleepwalking to the refrigerator every night and eating everything in sight. I was taken aback. I couldn't believe it. Stop acting like he didn't know it, he said. You must have been awake. I replied, no, father, I'm not acting. I was truly unaware that I've been sleepwalking and eating in my sleep. But now that we've finally solved the mystery of the increasing weight, we returned to the doctor with this new information and told her the situation. She laughed and told me that my discipline had denied my body the food it craved, but my brain had refused to cooperate and had overridden my will by urging me to eat in a subconscious state. She told me not to worry, though, that she could treat that. Armed with this knowledge and her support, and the support of my family, I felt that I could finally win this war. Hello, I'm Sarah. Ever heard of a phobia before? Don't worry, it's not contagious or anything. It just means you're scared of something in particular. Places, people, things. I have a phobia, but I don't like to talk about it. And I definitely don't want to be seen in that state. I was in my second year at college. I had been very busy that semester because we had a lot of assignments. And it was fine, I mean. I liked studying and completing tasks, but I was never a nerd or a geek. No. I like to dress nicely, too. I have my own fashion and style. It wasn't easy making friends, though. There were two types of people at my school. Smart nerds, who couldn't care less how they dress, and complete airheads, who dress nice. I didn't fit in either one of those groups, so I basically kept to myself, until one day, I got assigned to do a task with a girl and a boy, Jane and Kyle. They didn't look nerdy at all, and I thought to myself, oh great, looks like I'll be doing all the work. But when we started talking about the project, they didn't just sit there or toss ridiculous retorts. All three of us were having an actual conversation about the topic. I was so thrilled. It finally seemed like I belonged somewhere. We became friends and did everything together. We could tell each other anything. Well, not everything. I had one secret from my friends. I never told them I had a phobia. Anyway, a year later, Jane moved to Germany with her parents. 
She was going to finish college there. So it was just Kyle and I now. All through college, we were the best of friends. We even did our graduation project together. On graduation day, Kyle and I were supposed to go out for dinner. He wouldn't tell me where, said it was a surprise. And what a surprise it was. He had picked the highest tower in the whole city to eat dinner at the very top. I don't have a problem with high places in particular. In fact, I'm sure I'll love the view. If I ever make it to the top, no, I had a problem with the elevator. A phobia, to be precise. So we were standing at the base of the tower, and Kyle was happily listing all the great features and restaurants up there, but I didn't hear any of it. I was too busy fretting, frozen to the spot, desperately trying to find a way out of the situation. I couldn't say no to Kyle, who was all excited to go up the tower, so I clenched it in and tried my best to stay calm. We got in the elevator, and the doors shut. I couldn't control what came after that. I was terrified screaming and shouting hysterically, banging on the walls, then falling to the ground. Of course, I don't actually remember any of it. Kyle told me later on. The last thing I remember was the elevator doors shutting close. When I came to, I was at the hospital. Kyle was sitting by my bed looking worried. When he saw that I woke up and that I was feeling fine, he started laughing at me, saying, Why didn't you tell me you had a phobia? I felt ridiculous and started laughing too. And then, out of nowhere, he proposed. It was his plan all along. Although he pictured it at the top of the tower. All that happened three years ago. We're married now. And we have a baby girl. I'm being treated for my phobia. It's not completely gone, but I'm way better now. Apparently, hiding my problems never solves them. I'll have to face them sooner or later.